Welcome, hello. This is the last of today's focus events, I think. Is it? Yes. Is there anything? Okay, good. Um, thanks for coming to the last one. It's the afternoon. You've probably all had lunch, so maybe you'll fall asleep. But that's okay. Uh, we won't mind. Okay. Um, chaos or gift, creation, the Trinity, and Chesterton. Just because i got to throw Chesterton in everywhere all the time. <laughs> Kind of like one trick pony. I can do one thing. Uh, so that's what I do. Uh, OK. OK. Um, we're going to start today with a movie trailer. Um, uh, this trailer isn't necessarily graphic, but it, can, it might be disturbing. It's for a horror film. So if you just don't do that kind of thing, I don't do that kind of thing. I can't do it. So if that isn't you, it's not real bad, but if that isn't you, just don't watch. That's fine. Um, I, I don't think it'll be too terrifying, but uh, just, just in case. <laughs> Okay. No. Nope. Stop. Cease. <laughs> Go away. Okay. All right. Anybody here seen The Purge? This is, this is Purge 4, by the way. Um, I've seen none of them. Uh, <laughs> but thank you to my English 104 class for telling me about it. It's a perfect introduction. Um, how, how is it as a movie? Those of you who have seen it? It's, a good, it's bad? It's in a, the plot's bad. You all know, yeah. Well, yeah. my thing with it is that like, if editing was to go for 12 hours, like, why does everyone just murder? Like, why not just like those face to face with the girls and stuff and done with it? Okay. <laughs> yeah, no, that's. It's <laughs> <laughs> just you. Yeah, so for those of you who don't know and haven't seen um, the whole Purge franchise, this is number four. There was the Purge, the Purge Anarchy, the Purge Election Year. The first purge, that's this one, is predicated to dystopian society in the future. And for 12 hours, once a year, the government says, do whatever you want. There are no penalties. Murder, steal, burn, it doesn't matter. Do whatever you want for 12 hours. And chaos ensues, and people kill each other for 12 hours, and then order comes back. That's the premise of the movie, right? of all four movies. Um, and the whole drama of the film and the whole franchise turns on the fundamental assumption that if you remove our laws, just as Calla says, if you remove our laws and punishments underneath, people are vicious killing animals. The law civilizes us. The law restrains us. You and I are good because of externally imposed restraints. And if you take that away, we're all axe-wielding murderers ready to plunder and pillage to our heart's content. The real truth about human nature and our existence in the world is that we're savage and the laws, all that's keeping us from chaos. So take it away for 12 hours and what happens? Chaos. Take away the law and our real selves emerge, selves intent on destruction and death. Okay, that is just, I submit to you, the political philosophy of Thomas Hobbes writ large. In his famous work, The Leviathan, here it is, 17th century political philosopher. Here's Thomas Hobbes, Leviathan. He argues the basic nature of reality, the most true fact that we all have to deal with together, is the fact of violent death. Where are we going to start our political life together? What's going to ground our community? What's it going to be anchored on? Our fear of violent death, says Hobbes. That's the problem that politics has to deal with. That's the fundamental problem 
it has to solve. His phrase for this, not in Leviathan, but another work, although he says it lots of places, is bellum omnium contra omnes, the war of all against all. What's reality? That. The war of everybody against everybody else. Now that's crappy, right? Nobody wants to live in that world. You don't want to live in the world of the purge where there are no laws and you just could be killed sitting here listening to a lecture. So, says Hobbes, we cede some of our rights to the state. We need something to protect us. So, the state can do it, what he calls the Leviathan. And if you could see closer, this picture here, which picture the king, is just a bunch of little faces and heads make him up, make up his body. Right, we give away our rights to the state, the Leviathan, because the state can protect us from violent death. It can save us from that. It might have to take away some of our rights. It might have to send some of us out to war to kill other people. But that is worth it. That's a worthwhile trade-off for Hobbes. The chance that the state might send you off to die is better than the certainty that you're going to die violently on your own. Because the state is all that stands between you and your murderous axe-wielding roommates. Right, without the state, they're killing you in your sleep tonight. So Hobbes and the Purge are both working on the same premise. That the first fact about the world is that it's a chaotic, violent place. Period. Being, reality is defined by violence for both of them. And that's the subject of this talk. Here we are. The subject of this talk is something like, what's the basic name of reality? If you have one word to say, one word to define all of this. You, me, this, look out the window, right? The whole world. If you have one, wo one word, what is it? What do you say? If you just got one. That question, the basic name of reality, is at the heart of all of our disciplines. All of our disciplines have an answer for that. What's axiomatic? What's the foundation? What's the bedrock? What do we assume is fundamental about the world? What remains once everything else is faded? The fancy academic word for that is ontology, which is the study of being itself, something like that. In, a, in a, maybe a more direct technical definition, ontology is the study of what there is. What is there? What is is? What is reality? Today, we're concerned and we're starting with ontologies of violence. That is, answers to the question what is, which say violence is what is. That's the first fact. That's Hobbes. First problem of political philosophy, violence. That's the purge, I think. That's what we're going to be doing. Okay? If, you want, um, if you want some further reading, Here's where I'm, two, two sources for this talk, really. Um, Pierre Manent is a contemporary French political philosopher. Uh, his book, uh, An Intellectual History of Liberal, Liberalism, points out the ways in which early modern theorists like Hobbes base their political systems on defining evils. Or rather, base their political systems on avoiding evils rather than defining goods. And this legacy is still with us today. We have a much easier time naming evils that we should avoid, evils that we should eliminate, racism, genocide, hunger, et cetera, et cetera. That's easier for us than identifying goods, the goods toward which our political life ought to lead us. It's because Hobbes and others say from the outset the one question that politics can't ask, the one question that politics can say nothing to is what's the point of the human person? What's the good of the human person? What's his nature, his goal, his end? That question's forbidden in their thought. So we can really point out what we want to avoid collectively. But what we're all headed for, what the goal is, what the good life is, is much harder to articulate. Politics then has a purely negative or preventative kind of goal. Let's eliminate all the goods, we, all the evils we can. If I ask you the question, can politics make you a better person? Do we laugh, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> it can make you a worse person for sure. We all agree about that. The idea that our political life together might help us be better people is moderately humorous to us. That's Pierre Minette. The other work I'm drawing on is Orthodox theologian David Bentley Hart and his book, The Beauty of the Infinite, The Aesthetics of Christian Truth. Um, he's concerned there to offer a defense of the peaceful persuasion of the gospel. 
can you have peaceful persuasion? Or is all persuasion always violent? Is it always already an assertion of your will over somebody else, a dominance? That's what he's up to. Those are two great, you want to do some more reading on this topic? There you are. I'm just regurgitating them for you. OK. My argument today is that these ontologies of violence underwrite a lot of our modern thinking. So I want to tra trace out a few more in addition to Hobbes. We've seen Hobbes in the realm of politics. I want to do a couple more so you can get a sense of how this carries across a wide variety of disciplines. And then I want to contrast those ontologies of violence with the Christian understanding, which begins in the Trinity and moves out from there to the created order. So instead of ontological violence, violence at the root of all things, we'll discover peace instead of chaos, harmony. And instead of the war of all with all, a loving relationship of persons. And then we'll move back to the realm of fiction and Chesterton discover what this Christian ontology might look like as it gets worked out in the imagination. Okay? So here's our, here's our list. Here's our outline, very detailed, very specific. Um, okay. So if you get really bored with any one of these, just hold on to that list. There's more coming. Okay. Okay, a couple more ontologies of violence then. We've done a political philosophy. Um, how about evolutionary biology? I'm not talking about the fact of evolution as a scientific, scientific description of the way the world works. It's not what so much I want. But more about the philosophical framework that often or sometimes goes along with a merely evolutionary account of the world. But what's the basic principle of evolution? Survival of the fittest. Which is kind of the way the world works, right? Survival of the fittest. OK, fine. What's the other half of that principle? The death of the weak. Right? That's, that's the same thing. You could say survival of the fittest. You could say the death of the weak. It's the same thing. Why? Because nature's one great struggle. It's one big battle. In Tennyson's famous Victorian phrase, nature is, quote, red in tooth and claw. It's just dripping with blood. The natural order we love so dearly. Look, I mean, look outside all the beautiful trees. They're nice. They're changing colors. They're just the victors in the conquest, right? There's a lot of dead trees underneath those trees. Trees that they managed to eliminate by taking up all the sunlight, et cetera, et cetera. You, you've all watched the BBC documentaries or various other documentaries, right? Of, yeah. The strangler figs in India slowly suffocating other trees, et cetera, et cetera. It's, you ought to pay attention sometime to the language with which we narrate those things and personify all these trees. It slowly murders its neighbors. You know. <laughs> all right, watching a forest is just watching a very, very, very slow mortal combat where no prisoners are taken. OK, that just describes the natural world. Fair enough, right? That's true. Um, but at another level, it provides a wholly unsatisfactory metaphysics. Because if a world where victory of the strong is the fundamental principle of reality, then might makes right. <laughs> then whoever wins is right. Then whoever's got power is right. You can't talk about justice. Just talk about power. And if victory of the strong is the fundamental principle, then eugenics is always right around the corner. We just eliminate the weak people. That's the way the world works, after all. I think that uh, po Polish poet Sesław Miłosz points out this philosophy best when he says this in one of his poems. And some of you have read this with me. Here's, here it is. Quote, whoever considers as normal the order of things in which the strong triumph, the weak fail, and life ends with death, accepts the devil's rule. Say that one more time. Whoever considers as normal the order of things in which the strong triumph, the weak fail, and life ends with death, accepts the devil's rule. OK, here's another ontology of violence. It's present in studies of English and rhetoric as well. Uh, prevalent, in fact. Particularly in various theories of power and power dynamics in communication. So many theorists, especially contemporary ones, take as axiomatic the quote, this, this point, quote, every discourse, every conversation, is reducible to a strategy of power, 
and every rhetorical transaction to an instance of original violence. So every act of interpersonal communication can be traced back to power dynamics. Somebody's trying to win, to the assertion and domination of one person over another. Everything, every relationship you have can just be broken down along those power lines. Somebody's winning and somebody's losing. Somebody's asserting power and somebody's being dominated. Take the speech I'm giving, for instance. Right here, you and I, we're in a nice little rhetorical situation here. Who's got power? Who's got the power in the room? Me. Why? How do you know that? Standing. I'm standing. You all are sitting. Yep, good. How else? That's a position of dominance. You're talking, we're quiet. I'm talking and you're quiet. I'm even. Am I amplified? I don't know. Is this mic just recording that or am I just echoing? Okay. I'm talking loudly and you're all quiet. Yeah, that's a one way. Okay, good. How else? How else do you know that I'm in, I've got the power here? That I'm in control? We're all facing you. You're all facing me. Yeah, everybody's staring this way. Nobody's looking at each other. Okay. How else? I've got a structure that enables my authority right here. I've got a bunker. Come at me. I've got defenses, right? Good. What more? I'm dressed, I'm dressed up like people are dressed up who have important things to say and who you should listen to, right? I'm wearing the costume. All of that, signals. You're taking notes, some of you, on what I'm saying. All of that signals that I've got the power that I'm in control of the room. OK, now, I mean, that's just true at one level, right? Uh, how am I using this power? Well, on a, on a power dynamics, um, I'm using it in a very particular way, right? So far in my talk, I've ref uh, that was our quote, I've referenced a lot of dead white guys. Old dead white guys, here they are. Here are all the guys I've referenced in my talk so far. A couple of them aren't dead, but they're on their way. Um, <laughs> well, I'll get there soon enough. <laughs> Why? Why am I referencing a bunch of dead white guys? Because in our Western educational system, we're part that we're a part of, right? Old dead white guys are privileged sites of power. And control of them gives you authority and justifies your position as knowing something. Because I can command these guys and bring their quotes together and make them talk to you. I've got the power, given the system we're in. Right? Command of tradition, command of the canon, which happens to be not only but largely old dead white guys, grants me authority over you. It allows me to keep you as a student, as an other, which is directly in my interest because it's the students that you pay my salary. Right? I, don't, I want you to learn, but I don't want you to learn too much. If you learn too much, then you're me. And you know what I know. And if you know what I know, then why are you paying me to teach you? You're not. So I don't want you to learn that well. I mean, I want you to learn, right? Because I got to keep up the facade that this is something you're willing to pay for. But I got to be careful in how I do that. I'm invested in using this speech right here to make you think that you're learning something but also to continue to assert my superior control of the subject matter so that you keep paying me to teach you. That's a, that's a, that's a rhetorical analysis of what's going on here, a la power dynamics. Every speech act you partake in, every speech act you perform is inescapably linked to that system of powers, the power dynamics. And it's inescapable because, precisely because communication requires another person. And the other as other is dangerous and a threat. We've only got the war of all against all. And language is one of our main weapons in that war, a means of dominance, control, and assertion. Okay. I mean, just as a side note, and lest you think that sounds strange or weird, that is everywhere in studies of rhetoric and English and communication and persuasion. That's the dominant theoretical model, I would guess. That's really problematic for our Christian witness. 
right, as a sidebar, which relies upon persuasion, the persuasive power, the beauty of the gospel. If all per persuasion is just violent and self-interested in, self-interested, then the church's persuasion is just another, another power grab, another move in this long history. And you, can, you start to hear narratives like that. That starts to sound similar to you, things you've heard. Okay. All right. Good so far? Yeah? Okay, all three examples we've talked through. The Hobbesian Leviathan, Darwinian metaphysics, power dynamics, assume that reality is essentially violent chaos. Reduce it down at its core, being itself, existence, whatever you want to call it, is violent. And thus, life is a will to power, an endless cycle of domination and conquest. There's only two things in reality, victor and victim. You're either one or the other. That's the fundamental truth. Difference means violence. It's just a matter of who's got the power. Okay. Now, now, none of those accounts are completely wrong. If they were totally flawed, then they wouldn't convince anybody. Nobody believes something that's all wrong. What would persuade you about it? They're all right enough to be compelling, but wrong enough to be dangerous. Dangerous, I think, because they're incomplete. They name a truth of the world. They don't name the truth of the world. <coughs> so what name, to come back to our question, what name can we give reality? You got one word, what are you going to say? In order to do that, I think we first have to name God. So we have to start where most Christian thinking begins and ends. We have to start with the Trinity. What is the Trinity? <laughs> Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Yes, I hope we, I hope we all know this. This would be important to know. Okay. Three persons, one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Notice that there's difference at the very center of this definition. The Father is not the Son, and the Son is not the Spirit, and the Spirit is not the Son or the Father, and yet, somehow, they're all still one. But their difference is not violent. We don't have Hobbes' war of all against all here. Quite the opposite. We find perichoresis, which is our Greek word for the day. Here it is. Perichoresis. Perichoresis is just our technical theological term for the dance party happening in the Godhead. Quite literally, that's what it means, the dancing around. Right? Perichoresis is the self-giving dance of love of the three persons of the Trinity around each other. And it's one of our old theological words to talk about the Trinity and the relations of the Trinity. Peri from like perimeter, around, and choresis from chorus, dancing. So at the heart of everything, on a Christian account, is not chaos, but form, an ordered relation of persons, and a form of difference. That's at the heart of the Trinity, in otherness, which somehow remains a unity. So instead of some first opposition between the one and the many, and then reconciliation, which would be the classical model of metaphysics. Or simply the alienation of everything from everything else, which would be the modern model of metaphysics. Christianity only knows, and I'm quoting David Bentley Hart here, Christianity only knows, quote, differentiation and the music of unity. The infinite music of three persons giving and receiving and giving anew, end quote. I think Hart's musical reference here might give us a key to hold on to, if this sounds strange and different. Think of musical harmony. What does musical harmony require? What do you have to have to have harmony? Multiple notes. Multiple notes. If all the notes are the same, <laughs> you just have one note. You don't have harmony. Right? Har um, OK. Requires difference. And some root note, and some variations on that. But that's not violent. That's beautiful. And not just random notes either, right? Not just a random collection of notes. You won't get harmony. It requires different notes in ordered relation to each other. OK. 
Okay. That's Christianity's response, I think, and we'll work it out, to the problem, the ontologies of violence. And we don't ignore the problems. Of course the world is violent. Of course violence is at the heart of a lot of stuff. It's not, but that's not where you start. If you start from there, you just end up in the will to power. The first fact of anything, the place from which we must start everything is the difference of the Trinity, which is peaceful self-donation, peaceful self-giving of all the members of the Trinity to each other. God is a community of persons in ceaseless self-giving love. Therefore, difference is not some original loss or break, something we have to overcome and erase, nor is it only alienation. Difference is not dangerous, but rather the sight of the overflowing infinite love of God. Okay, there's the Trinity. From there then, we get to what we really want to talk about today, which is creation, which is the created order. It's not surprising that a Godhead for which otherness is essential might create a cosmos, a whole order other than itself, a whole order it might seek to draw back into its perichoretic dance. Indeed, we can understand the created order, the ontology of beings, only from the being of God. Okay, this is a dense point, but it's really important, so hang with me for a second. We're talking about being here. Small b as in our being, and capital B as in God's being. But you have to be really, really careful when you do this. What we don't mean is that you and I have being and God has being. And we have a little bit of being and God has a lot of being. That's not what we mean. As if somehow I'm 100% being and God is fully charged being, 100%. Or I'm at the bottom of the being ladder and God's at the top of the being ladder. That's, that's really problematic. Because then, if I have my tiny being and God has the most being, we still both have being. He's just better at it than me. And being is somehow more fundamental than God. And being ends up being a bigger category than God. He's just the best being there is, but being is still greater. You don't want to go there. We don't want to go there. <laughs> Instead, the Christian answer is that insofar as I have being, insofar as I exist at all, as I have any kind of reality, it's because I participate analogically in God's being. God's being is the canvas on which we, and in which we live out our lives. The being of everything stands in analogical relation to God's to be in itself to God. So Hart explains it this way. Maybe this helps. Quote, God is not the high who stands over against the low. Rather, God is the infinite act of distance that gives high and low a place. It's only in God that we can have high and low and any kind of difference. God's being is the sea which allows the possibility of our own existence. Maybe this helps more if we put it in the register of language. We might think of utterance and of word. If, Trinity, if the Trinity is utterance from the beginning, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, you know that one, then creation is a further address, I'm quoting Hart here, another modulation of the way in which God utters himself, in that which is infinitely different from him, which is, for this very reason, his tabernacle. That would be the created order. This means there's a likeness between the created order and God. An analogical likeness. It's not like they're on the same continuum and God's just better at it. There's always enough or greater unlikeness. But nonetheless, there's a likeness between God and the world. The analogy of being is possible only because within being per se, that is within God, in God's being, that our particular being is possible. In him we live and move and have our being. Take just the theological working out of that point. It's only within God that our particular lives are possible. Okay, that's a lot of dense stuff. Here's a little more of the practical payoff than I think. What this means is that if we want to name created reality, if we want one word to define all of this, we don't want the word violence. Instead, I think we want to say gift. It's all a gift. There are a couple ways of saying that. Here's a technical one. Finite existence itself. That's you, me, 
this podium, everything. Any created thing. Finite existence itself is a pure gift. Grounded in no original substance. Wavering from nothingness into the openness of God's self-outpouring infinity. Persisting in a condition of absolute fragility and fortuity. Impossible in itself and so actual beyond itself. That's a really dense quote. <laughs> so let's take a second and just work on, chew on a couple parts of that. Let's start with the end, maybe. <sighs> Finite existence is impossible in itself. We can't make ourselves. We didn't make ourselves. We don't make sense just on our own. We can't make ourselves make sense to ourselves. We're impossible in and on, just a And that means that to really be actual, we have to be somehow beyond ourselves. We're only actual insofar as we're in relationship to God. And therefore, in this condition, not having made ourselves, we're in a place of absolute fragility and fortuity. We're fragile flowers, you and I. Right? Any second. There we go. Because we don't make ourselves, so we don't control that. But also in a place of absolute fortuity. It's a pretty wonderful world we live in. It's got a lot of terrible things about it, sure. But there's even more stuff that's good. So we're not only fragile, we're fortunate. Okay. Okay. Now, what do we do with all that? What's our response? If it's a gift, what do you do when someone gives you a gift? Yes, you, okay, you take it. One, yes, you take it. Good. And you thank them. Exactly. That's just, that's just the good manners of gift getting, right? Not to thank someone, not to be grateful. If it's a gift, then we ought to say thank you. Here's a quote from Chesterton. I would maintain that thanks are the highest form of thought, and gratitude is happiness doubled by wonder. Say it again. Thanks are the highest form of thought, and gratitude is happiness doubled by wonder. So in the conclusion here, I want to look at what taking the world as gift seriously might look like. And the best champion of gratitude I know is our beloved gentle English giant, G.K. Chesterton. Okay. Now, here's my shameless promotion for the Chesterton Society, which is meeting tomorrow night, in fact. Uh, but also, we're going to have a lecture on Monday, November 12th, by Dale Alquist, who's the president of the American Chesterton Society. So he talks all over the country. Um, probably one of the top three people in the world, top three experts in the world on Chesterton. Maybe the top. He could be the top. Um, he's written a whole bunch of books. He's a fantastic speaker. He's great. He's hilarious. So he's going to come and give a talk called The Art of Murder, G.K. Chesterton and the Divine Detective. Monday, November 12th, RCF, 7 p.m. So come to that. Okay. Now. Gratitude. What might our gratitude look like? Um, to test our theory, I want to look, I want to just consider for a second the celebrated object of poetic and artistic attention through the ages, the boot lace, the shoelace. How many of you have shoelaces currently? Raise your hand. Yeah, I look all of it. I do. Good. All right. Let's just think about our, I know you've, you've spent a lot of time thinking about boot laces, their importance in history, their social necessity, their beauty. Jonathan's written many artistic uh, essays on the beauty of the bootlace. Okay, so this is going to be our subject for a second. Now, if we were subscribe to these ontologies of violence, we have a Chesterton poem on a bootlace coming up, so that's why I'm going here. But, but let's just run it through those ontologies of violence from before, right? We could give a lot of different readings of the bootlace. If we were Hobbes, we might say that bootlaces remind us the necessity for the Leviathan. After all, if you're putting on your boots, why do you put on your boots? If you're going to put on your boots, why? 
You're going to go do something. You don't put on your boots if you're going to sit on the couch and play video games. You're going to go outside and do something. Because you want to get something done. Someone's going to take some effort, some work that you want to do. And if nature is just the war of all against all, then whatever work you do, somebody's just waiting to kill you for it, They're waiting to steal it from you. So for Hobbes, we say, thank goodness then for the Leviathan, which guarantees that my boot lacing won't be in vain, that I'll put on my boots for some, I'll get something out of it. Right? Our Darwinian reading of boots might say that our ability to tie our boot laces quickly gives us some calculable survival advantage. Right? We can probably run away faster if our boots are tied. Power dynamics would tell us that boots are a symbol of the oppressive domination of the patriarchy, which has kept its literal and metaphorical boot on the other through the ages. Chesterton says, forget about that for a minute and just think about the glory of bootlaces. I'm sure you have lots. Here's his poem. Here's his poem on bootlaces. That's one of my favorite poems of his. Bootlaces. Once I looked down at my bootlaces. Who gave me my bootlaces? The bootmaker? Bah! Who gave the bootmaker himself? What did I ever do that I should be given bootlaces? <laughs> Isn't that a great poem? <laughs> oh. Notice the way in which it considers and rejects usual answers to this question. To point us to the giftedness of our lives. It won't do to say that my bootlaces are from the bootmaker. That kind of answer explains without explaining. It's an answer, but not the answer, because it only leads to another question. Well, how did he come to be a bootmaker in the first place? Who gave the bootmaker himself? The full answer to the bootlace question has to lie in the infinite plenitude of the Trinity. The poem also points us to the fragility and fortuity of our lives. Right? What have we done that we should be given bootlaces? What have you and I done to deserve bootlaces? Nothing. We never could. Bootlaces are a glory beyond our expectation and beyond our deserving. Just like every other thing there is. What do you really deserve? We don't deserve a thing. How could we deserve it? On what grounds? We don't deserve anything. And yet, we have them. We've got bootlaces, we've got coats, we've got shirts. We've got all kinds of things. Hurrah! We live in a cosmos that has bootlaces. That's just fundamentally better than a cosmos that doesn't, I think. <laughs> okay, that's, that's the kind of ontology of gratitude that Chesterton's pointing us to, to really being thankful. And I think if we can begin to practice that, we can start to answer some of the various ontologies of violence that are roaming about the world. Okay, so to pair with this gratitude, last thing, I want to think about the poetry of order. Again, if the world is a gift, it's also analogous to the Trinity. It also teaches us something about the Trinity, which is an ordered relation of persons. So I'm going think about the poetry of order for just a second. And then you can go out into this lovely afternoon and practice being thankful. OK, Chesterton's novel, The Man Who Was Thursday, starts as a detective thriller about anarchists who want to blow up Europe and philosophical policemen who want to stop them. But it quickly becomes much more surreal and strange. You just have to read that. How many of you have read this novel before? Yeah. It's great. It's trippy. The novel opens with a debate about order and form between two poets, Lucian Gregory, the anarchist poet, and Gabriel Syme, the poet of order. Gregory, the anarchist, argues that the, quote, artist is identical with the anarchist. They both disregard convention and prefer one moment of blazing beauty to side concerns about body count, artistic taste, or any of that. Quote, the poet delights in disorder only, he claims. If it were not so, the most poetical thing in the world would be the Underground Railway, the subway system in London. So it is, said Syme. <laughs> and he's really serious about that fact. He means it. He goes on to wax eloquent about the train stations. This is what he says. The rare and strange thing, he says, is to hit the mark, to actually arrive at the station. The gross and obvious thing is to miss it. We feel it is epical when one man with one wild arrow strikes a distant bird. 
Is it not also epical when one man with one wild engine strikes a distant station? Chaos is dull, because in chaos, the train might go anywhere, to Baker Street or to Baghdad. But man is a magician, and his whole magic is in this, that he says, Victoria, and lo, it is Victoria. No, take your books of mere poetry and prose. Let me read a timetable with tears of pride. And he's really very serious about it. He means it. So here's an exercise for us. I put it off the train time schedule. Here it is. Just take some copies and hand them back. This is for the Amtrak in Michigan. How many people have taken the Amtrak train in Michigan before? Lots of us. See, you've had to use this thing or some version of it. All right, just hand, yeah, just pass them back. OK. And I want you to just to think for a second with the people at your table. What's beautiful about this? Do you weep while you read it because of its beauty? Simon says he does. What? <laughs> uh, so what's beautiful about this thing? Why might you weep tears of pride when you read it? Just look at it. Talk at your tables for a second. Take a minute or two. All right, what do you think? <clears throat> Anyone just start to weep uncontrollably at the beauty of it? No, this is a strange exercise. This is weird. Is there anything beautiful here? Yes, there is. What is it? Okay, how um, there's so many different trains going on the same tracks and how they don't like, intersect with the lives. Yeah, that's one of the things. Can't you just sense that? I mean, you've seen train crashes before, right? Are they pretty? No, they're horrible. They're awful. They just they destroy lots of things. That's like, can't you just sense the, the, the potential disaster that's averted at every moment on this sheet? Like the glass and the, the broken glass and the fires and the screams are right around the corner of this sheet. OK, good. What else? What else is beautiful? If there's anything, if there, I mean, we don't think like this normally. What do you think? Come up with anything else? There are a lot of different possibilities for places to go, which means different places to adventure in and like experience new things. Yeah. Where are we stopping here? Chicago, Hammond, Michigan City, St. Joseph, Bangor, Holland, New Buffalo, Niles. Kalamazoo, Battle Creek, East Lansing, Owasso, Flint, Lapeer, Ann Arbor, Dearborn, Detroit, Troy, Windsor, London, Ontario, Toronto. Anybody want to go to any of those places? That sounds great. It's all right here. This is your, I mean, and how long is it going to take you to get there? Ah, oh, we could do the math. I don't know, it's probably not going to take you longer than 12 hours to get anywhere. I'm going to guess. I don't I haven't done the math. How long is it going to take you to get to any of those places 300 years ago? 
400 years ago? No longer than 12 hours. Yeah, this is, I mean, this is a crowning achievement. It has good things and bad things I about, about I suppose, but the, the amount, the thousands of tons of steel moving at incredible rates per hour that this paper represents, and all the people on it rushing around at those speeds, getting where they're supposed to go, right? You, you, you get on the train at Union Station, you're going to take it to Toronto. It might take you a while, and maybe there's a delay somewhere. But is anyone really worried they won't get to Toronto? No. And there's a beauty in that. There's a poetry to order. We like to think that chaos is more compelling. We like to think that revolution is really exciting. Maybe. I'm sure it is. But order is just as compelling, maybe more compelling. When we think about beauty, we often think of these big, grand, now we're romantic, so big sunsets, big mountains, oh, the force, the power of nature. And if any of you went to Dr. Bilbrow's talk earlier this morning, I think he talked a lot about that, about the sublime. There's a poetry to order, though, one we should pay attention to. So here's my question, then, in the end. Have you looked at your bootlaces recently? Or your train schedules? How about the plumbing and electricity in your dorms? Which are just always there. Keeping you warm. And giving you light. And hot water when you shower. Right. How many, um, your general emotional state when you go to shower in the morning and there's only cold water is what? Irritation. Maybe then you wish you were in the Hobbesian state of nature so you could go wreck some mayhem on people. I'm just a... Right? And yet every morning we take hot showers, which is a pretty remarkable thing to do. Like, hmm, hot water. You don't think about it. You don't think about it because we're so used to it. How about, how about, how recently have you thought about those fantastically wonderful, mysterious, strange creatures walking around called other people. <laughs> and we're just used to each other. And so we forget. So maybe if we could begin to practice our gratitude for these things. Simple things. Maybe if we can practice our happiness doubled by wonder at the gift of the world, then maybe we could begin to offer a compelling alternative to these ontologies of violence that surround us on all sides. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, thank you.